Wow, welcome. I like it. You're a little closer here now. And uh, so how many people, it's your first time to ever come to a women's? We got one or two. Um, uh, okay. How many people uh, went all last semester? Okay. Is there anybody here that went in the morning and that's now coming in the evening? Or Okay, so you were morning, now you're evening. Okay, so anyway, it's great to be with you. I love, love, love the doctrines of grace. Um, when I was about 16 years old, maybe 15, I was trying to remember, I was in a class with a teacher named David Taggart, and he introduced to me the doctrines of grace. And I never will forget where I was sitting and what I felt like. I was sitting on the front row, maybe the second second row to the left, and he was at the podium. I never will forget what it looked like. And he started trying to tell me about the doctrines of grace, total depravity, unconditional election, on and on and on. And my blood started to boil. I was so upset. I had never heard anything like that, and I thought it was heretical. And uh, I just want you to know <laughs> that if I say something tonight or in the next few weeks and it makes you angry, then you're not alone. Because the doctrines of grace are not natural for us. Uh, we don't necessarily understand the doctrines of grace until we've studied the Word of God and, and, and sometimes over a long period of time. But I can tell you this, there is nothing greater than understanding the doctrines of grace. And here's why. What it does is it helps us understand who God is in a greater way. God is always so much bigger than we think he is. Matter of fact, we're going to start tonight as a backdrop. And I was thinking if David Taggart would have uh, taught me on the sovereignty of God first, then I think it maybe would have been easier for me to digest the doctrines of grace. So we're going to start tonight on the sovereignty of God. And I know a lot of us know about the sovereignty of God. I, I love the sovereignty of God. If I love the doctrines of grace, I especially love the sovereignty of God. And I was studying today and I was thinking, I can't get enough of this. I can never know enough about the sovereignty of God. And so here's my goal for you tonight is that you leave here with a larger, bigger view of who God is. And I can tell you this, the more we come to understand the sovereignty of God, the easier it is to get through life, to deal with the problems that are on your plate today, the problems that you left at home, the problems that you face tomorrow. When we understand the sovereignty of God, it is one of the most comforting, joyful peace-giving doctrines that you can ever have. And I don't think we can ever come to a full understanding and grasp of the sovereignty of God, but we can just continue to grow and, and learn. So I'm, I'm super excited to be with you tonight, and I hope that um, you can just take a little bit away of a greater knowledge of who God is. So if you, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to turn, I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 23. Now, would it surprise you that our transition text is a prayer? And it's going to be a prayer about the sovereignty of God, naturally, right? Perfect transition. And so we're going to read this starting in verse 23. When they had been released, they went to their own companions, that was their church members, um, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they had heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said... Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? 
The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. How many of you have ever heard of the Great Continental Divide? Don't everybody raise their hand. We got a couple. All right, good. We got a few. Well, it's a physical feature that runs down the western part of the United States, and it actually stretches. It's an imaginary line that stretches from, from literally Alaska all the way down through the United States, through Colorado, North America, all the way down through South America. It stretches 19,000 miles. Now, we should know more about it, I guess, shouldn't we? It's delineating where all the waters flow into the Pacific and the Atlantic. And the east side obviously drains into the Atlantic and... Um, the west side into the Pacific Ocean. It, it, this continental divide, this, this landmass structure, unites the continent in one shared geography. And you might say, well, so what? <laughs> what does that mean to me? Well, what if there was no continental divide? Let me tell you what would happen. There would be no drainage barrier to separate which wa way the water flows on our continent. There, there would be a massive shift in the distribution of our water resources in our country. It'd be totally different. There'd be mixing of water regions, disrupting of natural balance, and there would cause a lot of ecological confusion. And since it impacts where the fresh water goes and the other water, it also would impact where the people live. So if we didn't have the Continental Divide, we wouldn't even have our cities located where they're located. And so our Lord strategically placed this amazing Continental Divide in the North American and South American continent to unite it and to unify the entire geography of our country. And... It, it's, it's an amazing structure. And not many of us, as we saw, have heard of this great continental divide. But it doesn't change the fact, even if we haven't heard it, that it has this immense value because it impacts not only the physical features, again, but the climate and, and nature and resources and the environment. And without it, we, we would lack stability and unpredictability and weather patterns and, and everything. And I mention this great continental divide because there is a great continental divide in theology. And you know what it is? In God's economy, it's called the sovereignty of God. It's the sovereignty of God. He's sovereign in everything. It has incredible significance, even if you've never heard of it, even if you've never studied it. But without it, everything in Christianity would be upside down. There'd be no certainty. There'd be instability. Everything would be chaos. And just like the fact that we're not born knowing about the Continental Divide... We're not born knowing about God's sovereignty. We just don't know. And not only are we not, are we born not knowing about God's sovereignty, but our nature, because of our sin nature, we fight against 
knowing God's sovereignty. You know why? Because we naturally don't want anybody to rule over us. Uh, our, our nature fights anything or anyone that exercises authority over us. And so we naturally run from it. And so how do we learn about the sovereignty of God? Well, we come to know about God's sovereign rule one way. What is it? How do we learn about God's sovereign rule and his sovereignty? The Bible. We have to study our Bibles. We have to peel back the scriptures and study it. And, and it has to be revealed to us. And, and it's, it's through the reading and the teaching of the Bible through the Holy Spirit in our lives. So it comes from studying the Word of God. Now when we speak about the sovereignty of God, here's what we mean. We mean that God has absolute and supreme authority over everything you can think of and everything you can't. He has the power and the wisdom and the authority to do whatever he chooses. Listen, he directs every detail in the lives of of men and women in this entire world. In all the creatures and in every circumstance. He has complete control and oversight. And his will and purposes are ultimately always accomplished exactly as he planned them. It means that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and no one can prevent him from accomplishing anything. Now, simply put, God is sovereign over creation. He is sovereign over history. He is sovereign over salvation, and he is even sovereign over your present circumstances today. And so we've got to understand, if we want to understand, the doctrines of sovereign grace, we've got to understand God's sovereign rule. Now, it runs all through the Bible. Now, what's interesting is you'll never find the word sovereignty in the Bible. But it runs all through the Bible. It's, it's a concept that is in almost in every book of the Bible. For instance, we've been through the study of Joseph in Genesis. There's 14 chapters. He's sold into slavery by his jealous brothers he rises to prime minister in Egypt. His brothers come seeking food in the famine. Almost 22 years later, you know the story. They finally realize he's the one selling them the food because he's the prime minister. And they fear they're going to be murdered after their father dies. And this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. They come to him. And they say this in Genesis 50, 20. If this is not one of your favorite verses, it needs to be. They're worried. They're scared. They're, they, they're guilty. They know that dad's gone, and they can be wiped off the earth immediately. And they come to their brother in humility. And here's what he said. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. You see, he understood God's sovereignty. He understood, Joseph did, that God worked all these pains and difficulties in his life, and he had a purpose, even though when he was in it right then or in the middle of things or in the dungeon or not understanding what his brothers are doing, he still trusted in the sovereign hand of God. And at the end of all of it, 20-something years later, here's what he says. You meant it for evil against me, 
but God meant it for good. You see, God can use anything and do anything to accomplish his will. That is God's sovereign rule. Now, what's the twin verse in the New Testament to that? Surely you know what the twin verse is. Romans 8, 28. Uh, 8, 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, there is not a greater verse in all of the Bible that explains God's sovereign rule over everything that's beyond us than this verse and this story. And so instead of going to verses that speak about God's sovereign rule, I thought it would be fun to jump inside the apostles' heads in a very traumatic, dark time in their life and listen to what they pray and see how they address God. And that's what we find here. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John had been hammered. Horrible day. They were being persecuted. They were being threatened. And it wasn't over. They had just healed a lame man. They were arrested. They were brought in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and they heard the worst thing they could ever hear. Here. They get interrogated, and here's what they say. You are not, you're commanded not to speak or teach about Jesus again. Now go. Now you can imagine the fear. Stephen had just been stoned by these people. And so they're wondering, what are we going to do? This is our mission, to teach and preach about Jesus. And now we've been threatened. Really, our lives have been threatened if we say anything. But what are we going to do? And this is a fantastic model for us, this prayer, when we go through it, because we see what they do in a most distressing time in their life. And how many of us have difficult, worrisome times and we need help? This is a prayer that we can model. It's a great model. And so before they start this prayer, they, they, they leave, they come and meet with um, other church members. And here's what they do. They fill their minds with God's divine sovereignty. They go straight to the top. Who is this God that we're serving? Who is this God that called us? He's sovereign God. And they lift their hearts to God and they pray approaching him. I want you to write these down. Four incredible, glorious ways that we need to look at God. And here's number one. They approach God in prayer, verses 23 and 24, as sovereign Lord over all creation. That's where they start. Sovereign Lord over all creation. Then, in verses 25 and 26, they approach the Lord as the sovereign Lord of history. This is just, just unbelievable. Unbelievable their understanding of who God was. And then verses 27 and 28, they approach the Lord in their prayer as the sovereign Lord over salvation. So the sovereign Lord over creation, the sovereign Lord over history, the sovereign Lord over salvation. And then lastly, the sovereign Lord over their present circumstances. What's happening to them right now in their lives? You know, it's so easy to think God's uh, concerned about the big picture. What's going on in uh, Russia or in the Middle East. But no, God is sovereign over your present circumstances. 
Every single thing in your life, He is. So I want us to begin here and look starting in verse 23. When they had been released, and this is Peter and John, they went to their own companions. That's the body of believers. And they, you can imagine uh, it's a group like this, and, and Peter and John come running back, and they say, well, tell us what's happening. And they've got this panicked look on their face. And, and it says they really... Um, reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So they gave them a blow-by-blow description. I mean, this is real life. This is what they said. This is what they told us not to do. Verse 24, when they'd heard this, they lifted their voices to God in one accord. Now, now I love this because they were all together in one voice and one heart, and they were united in the oneness of Christ. And this is corporate prayer at its best. And they said, here's what they said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, I'll confess to you, I don't think that would have been the first thing I said. But it needs to be. Because when I come to the Lord with a problem in my life or a concern, no matter how big or small, I need to understand who I'm praying to and who my Lord is. And you do too. And they do. Now, this is a direct quotation from the Old Testament. It's, it's seen several times in Exodus and Psalms and other places. But I want you to notice, notice they call on the Lord as sovereign ruler over all creation. They elevate him. You remember Jeremiah, he was in a terrible situation. The Babylonians were sieging Jerusalem, and Zedekiah, who was king of Judah, throws Jeremiah in jail. For prophesying that Jerusalem and Israel would fail or fall to the Babylonians, and he was in a dire straits. I mean, his nation's falling, he's in jail, nobody's listening to him. And here's what he says in Jeremiah 32 17. Just listen to this. O oh Lord God, O oh Lord God. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. So he too calls on, the first thing he does is call on the sovereign Lord over all creation. And here's what he says at the end. Nothing, nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing. And that's the key phrase, isn't it? If our Lord created the heavens and the earth, nothing is too difficult for him. What in your life, ladies, right now seems insurmountable? What on your prayer list seems like it's never going to be answered? You need to look right here. Your sovereign God, nothing is too difficult for him. And isn't it striking that, that, that these disciples, just like Jeremiah, in their most trying times, they stop and they reflect on who they serve and who God is, that he is sovereign over creation. He was the one that just through divine utterance, the sun and the moon in the entire universe came about. He simply spoke, think about this, effortlessly, and the Grand Canyon was made. He called into existence the Rocky Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean with no effort. And here's the point. If God created this vast universe by simply speaking it into existence, 
Well, he can certainly control everything in it. And they're recognizing the fact that God has this unfathomable power, this unlimited capabilities. And they're saying, here are my problems, and here are your capabilities. You can do all of this, and my problems are this big. What do I have to worry about? And so if God can create the entire universe, it's much, much, much less work for him to handle your trials. See, it's an argument from the greater to the lesser. And these great men of God, that's where they went first. And that's where we need to go. So the first thing they do is recognize while they have severe problems and they're frightened and they're concerned, they still find themselves in the presence of God who is reigning and ruling and he's on his throne. And ladies, we need to remember that, don't we? How, how easy is it to forget that that is the God we serve. See, most of the time we have too low of a view of God, uh, and it's crucial. It is so crucial. We grasp a heightened consciousness of the greatness of our God who is alive and well and sitting on his throne orchestrating all of his plans, all of his purposes, for your good, perfect good, and for his glory. He is truly Lord over creation, which proves we can trust him for anything, right? So they start by facing their problems, these, these apostles. And they address God as the sovereign Lord over creation. And next, they address God as the sovereign Lord over history. This gets good. You know, it's great. You know, we talked about this praying scripture. Well, they're praying Psalm 2. They quote Psalm 2. They go straight to a scripture that speaks about this ongoing rebellion in in history, we see it in the lost world. It's all about a continual futile attempts of plots to dethrone the Lord, break down Christians, and free his sovereign rule and break him down from his authority. That's going on and on and on. It's a rebellion that we've seen all throughout history, and we're going to continue to see that. And here's what he writes, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, David spoke this Psalm 2. He said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? In other words, the people are fighting against God. They're trying to dethrone him. It's futile. And David's expressing his amazement that men and nations are trying to overthrow God. It's, it's a worthless waste of time. <laughs> Then in verse 26, he says, look, the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So everybody, all the world's rulers, political leaders, world leaders, kings, countless others try to resist God and their efforts are always in vain. That's what David is saying here. And so now Peter and John very wisely bring this psalm to their mind to remind themselves that all throughout history, God has been threatened, and yet he always wins. He's continual, continually ruling over history. Look at our world today. I mean, has God 
lost control. I mean, I, I can't even believe what I see on television. I can't even believe what our Congress does and doesn't do. And, and we have to wonder, has God lost control? One part of us does. But what we know is absolutely not. Never, ever, ever. Not one inch. And so David answers in verse 4 of Psalm 2, and you don't have to turn over there, but here's what he says. He, God, who sits, he sits, meaning he's on his throne, sovereignly ruling. He says, who sits in the heavens. He merely laughs. He laughs. Do you see that? As men shake their fist at God, the sovereign God who rules history laughs. He laughs at them. And he also goes on to say, he scoffs. He also scoffs. He ridicules and mocks their puny efforts. King Jehoshaphat of Judah in 2 Chronicles 26 said this, Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one, no one can stand against you. Why isn't God doing something right now? <laughs> Why is he letting this just continue to spiral out of control? Aren't things going too far? We can ask, our, ask that question. And Paul wrote in Romans 2, he says, Do you not think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? In other words... God is being patient. He's holding back his wrath. And in his infinite wisdom, he is waiting for all of those who are his to come to him. Someone said this, don't mistake God's restraint and patience for complacency. So these disciples, uh, they're not just drawing on the fact that God, God is sovereign over history. But they're doing what we should be doing in, in any trial. And that is, we're reminding ourselves in the middle of a trial that there's nothing going on in world history or in our personal history or anything in our lives that God isn't using marvelously, that's right, and orchestrating for our good and His glory. And I can tell you, there is nothing more comforting for me when I think of my worries and my concerns and my difficulties when I go back to this and I understand who my great sovereign Lord is. Does that comfort you? It did the, it did the apostles. You know what John Piper said? I like this. The presence of hope in the invincible sovereignty of God drives out fear. It really does. It really does. And so these apostles come to God in this incredible time of distress and concern. And they address him first as sovereign Lord of creation. They address him second as the sovereign Lord of history. And thirdly, they address him as the sovereign Lord of salvation. Now, this is awesome. It gets better. Verse 27. These apostles are naturally remembering back to the worst opposition they'd ever seen in their life. 
And obviously they're going back to the cross. And they're seeing what the Lord faced. And they're seeing and remembering the direct attack that Jesus had and, and what happened to him. And look what they, they said. For, for truly, verse 27, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus. He's talking about the masses that came against Jesus. There. You anointed, listen to this, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, those two bad guys, along with the Gentiles, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, all those people. So there was a concerted effort of individuals and groups who hated Jesus' message, and they wanted to eliminate him, including Herod, including Pontius Pilate, including everybody. And now notice how the disciples couch this sin of all these wicked men who killed Jesus. Do you see this? I, this, this is, you've got to see this. Verse 28, he says, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. What God's hand and God's purpose predestined these men to do. That is the sovereign rule of God in salvation. Yes, these wicked men were sinning of their own free will, but God is mysteriously using it to accomplish his purpose, and he ordered it and ordained it. Do you see what's happening here? God was using sinful, evil, wicked men to bring about salvation for me and you. What an accident. It wasn't an accident. Look, they could only do what was predestined for them to do. All of it was happening at the sovereign initiative of our gracious God to execute his great plan of salvation. They were only allowed to do whatever God's hand and God's purpose predestined them to do. Now sit there and try to figure that out. We can't. We can't. It's beyond us. Ladies, when we get into this, there's no way to understand some of these great doctrines. And I can tell you, if we could, then we'd be God. This is beyond us because this is God's working. We're not meant to understand how all this works. We just have to accept it. And all these men involved in the murder of Jesus, Pilate and Herod, listen, they were only tools in the hands of God. Do you remember John 19, 10 and 11? Pilate said to Jesus, do you know who I am? I can take your life away. I have the authority to release you. I have the authority to crucify you. Remember what our Lord said? Jesus answered, You have no authority over me unless it has been given to you from above. Ladies, that is our sovereign Lord over creation, over history, and over salvation. Jesus said, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back. And so do you see now how the apostles are drawing on such great strength 
when they think about the sovereignty of God in their darkest times. They're thinking about what happened to Jesus, and yet it was God's plan. It happened perfectly, exactly as it was planned to. And we can all see that God's sovereign in his salvific work, and he's planned it out meticulously and executing it flawlessly. Ladies, we serve a big God. And Peter and John, Peter and John in their difficult times, they're just reflecting back on who Jesus was. It's giving them comfort. And so they come to God and they think of who he is and what he's doing. And lastly, they look at him as sovereign Lord over their present circumstances. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, and now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. You know what's interesting? They didn't ask God to take away their problem. They, look what they said. They just said, take note of it. Give me the courage to endure it with boldness and speak the truth. And you know why I think they didn't pray for him to remove the trial? Because they knew he was sovereign. They had a greater view and, a, and just this grasp of his sovereignty that I wish we had. And they knew whatever was going through is what they wanted to go through. They didn't want God to take something away from them that wasn't the best thing for them. And so they just said, grant your bondservants confidence that we can endure it. In verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. This wasn't in California. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word with boldness. Now, what was shaking? What was shaking? It was the power of God. That's what was shaking. They were tapping into the sovereign, ruling power of God Someone said the prayer meeting was shaken by the power of God. It was a supernatural sign of God's divine presence. And, and it was as if God was saying, I'm present and I'm sovereign over what is going on in your life right now. And I'm going to answer your prayer. It's awesome. Awesome. So they came to God and a great time of distress, which we do. And they drew strength on one thing, his sovereign rule over creation, over history, over salvation, and over every circumstance in their life. Jonathan Edwards said, this is the stumbling block on which thousands fall and perish, the sovereignty of God. If we go on contending with God about his sovereignty, it will be our eternal ruin. It's absolutely necessary that we should submit to God as our absolute sovereign and the sovereign over our souls as one who may have mercy on whom he will have mercy and harden whom he will. The sovereignty of God is, is truly seen as a great comfort and great assurance because it means that God is in control of both the big picture and the little picture. 
the big things and the little things. And the more, ladies, we understand the sovereignty of God and we'll continue to grow and grow, we'll never reach a full understanding of it, the higher our view of God will be. And that will lead to a greater understanding that if he's not sovereign, he's not God. And I can tell you, ladies, it will bring more joy and more peace and more comfort in your times of trial than anything else anywhere is to go back like these men did and understand who our great God is. Spurgeon said, there's no attribute of God more comforting to his children than the doctrine of divine sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe troubles, they believe that sovereignty has been ordained, their afflictions have come, that sovereignty overrules them, and sovereignty will sanctify them. And so, we begin tonight on the sovereignty of God. Because that's, that's the backdrop. That's the foundation. You know, we're in the construction business. And if we go build a house and we don't drill piers down to the bedrock and pour that foundation on those piers, then we can build that whole house and it just fall. It falls. Starts cracking. Doors don't shut. Holes in the roof. It falls. And what we want to do is build our foundation on who God is, on understanding Him first, that He's sovereign. And you know what that does, ladies? That takes it all out of us, doesn't it? Gives Him all the credit. We talked about that when we had prayer. We talked about that. Well, I'm going to end here. It's a, it's, if we could just spend the next five weeks on the sovereignty of God, I think it'd be great. But we're going to move on, and I hope that, um, I hope this, this will help you, because if anything we need to be doing is we need to constantly be stretching our minds to understand this great God. Constantly. And that's what will bring us joy and peace and humility. All right, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, what a great, what a great um, word that you had for us tonight. Uh, Father, we, we all have um, stresses in this world. We face difficulties. We face concerns. We're worried for our families, for our children. For our grandchildren, for tonight, tomorrow, next week, we have health issues. Uh, Father, we have job issues. You know them all, Father. You know every single one of them. And Father, we can rest and help us rest that you know every single detail in our lives, that you are sovereign. And Father, that is what gives us the ability to rest, to just rest. And Father, help us rest. Help us rest in you. And Father, also help us understand that your sovereign rule gives us hope. And so, Father, give us hope. Help us rest and give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen.